So, Renato, does it ever make sense to file a recusal motion against a judge overseeing your case? <sighs> it's complicated. I'm Renato Miriati. I'm a former federal prosecutor, a practicing lawyer, and a legal analyst. And I'm Asha Rangappa. I teach national security law at Yale University. I'm a former FBI special agent, and I'm a legal contributor for ABC News. And we're here to help you understand topics that can't be boiled down into a soundbite or a tweet. So, um, in a move that surprised no one, uh, Trump, through his lawyers, has requested Judge Tutkin, the judge that's overseeing his federal January 6th uh, case prosecution in D.C. to recuse. And basically, he is alleging, as he does with pretty much anyone who's not Judge Aileen Cannon, that she is biased and can't be impartial uh, in terms of overseeing his case. So that's what prompted our yes. our kickoff topic, though I think this is a broader question because... um. You know, we've seen this question come up in other contexts. Indeed. So uh, this is not his first judicial recusal motion, right? I think he filed one in Manhattan as well, if I recall correctly. Correct. Uh-huh. Um, like you said, not very surprising uh, that, ju- uh, that that Trump didn't like Judge Chutkin for a variety of reasons um, and that he wanted to do this. Uh, here's, I guess, what I would say. You know, th- there's that old, that, that internet meme, of like, you know, it's a it's a bold move, Cotton. Let's see if it works out for him. Uh, that's that's basically, you know, my general reaction towards judicial recusal motions. You know, the person who gets to decide in the first instance whether they recuse is the judge, and it's not going to surprise anyone listening to this podcast. The judges rarely decide that they're so, uh, you know, that they're so unfair and so biased that they can't possibly you know, treat someone fairly in a case. It's just, it almost never happens. But to be fair, that's sure. not the only consideration. A judge ne- is not only required to consider whether they can, in fact, be impartial and fair, but whether there may be questions in the perception of their fairness and impartiality. Like if there's something, right? Like there are stewards of True. the legitimacy of the justice system Generally, so they might say, "Okay, my brother-in-law is coming in and representing a party before me. And, you know, secretly, I hate my brother-in-law and I think I could be totally fair. But but people are going to think, you know, it could look this way. And, you know, I probably this is probably not a good look for me overall. Yeah, I think that's your one one million percent correct. That's right. And it doesn't change my analysis, which is that judges rarely decide that. Yes, you're true. That's true. You're, that's more precise. It, judges rarely uh, are co- are concerned about that either. It's just the reality of things is that judges tend to decide that they're fantastic and that they should continue working on cases unless they really want to get rid of a case, which is pretty, you know, in this context, pretty rare because when someone tells them that they could be unfair or there there's a perception issue with them, they don't like hearing that. I, just to put it in a different context, right? The United States Supreme Court uh, there's many justices, there's you know multiple justices that various people of the public think are unfair or biased and so on. And I don't recall any of those highly publicized instances where people of the public were clamoring for recusal where it actually happened, right? So um, th- there are reasons, nonetheless, why you know you might uh, potentially have a recusal motion. And I will tell you, I, I am. My view on this is different than some lawyers. I mean, there are some lawyers who utilize this more aggressively. I used to be a, one of them used to be a partner of mine who loved filing these things. Um, I, I think they're usually um, uh, they usually just piss the judge off um, and accomplish nothing. Um, but it does set things up for an appeal potentially. There's an argument that if the judge is already dead set against you, that it kind of shoots a you know, a, 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 you know, a shot across the bow that like, hey, we think you're unfair. Like it could sometimes make them second guess, suppo- you know, supposedly or so the theory goes um, and, um, you know, get them thinking about, you know, how to make sure that they're perceived to be fair. 
Um, I, I don't think that's going to work here. I mean, that, uh, you know, Judge Chutkin has been like a brick wall uh, with all of Trump's arguments. And I think this is, she gave the government, I think, what, three days to respond. And uh, that gives you, that tells you how, how much deep consideration she's giving to this motion um, or how, how much time she thinks it, it's going to take to do away with these arguments. So, um, and there, I will also note um, that it is very hard to review these on appeal. Um, it's, you know, the standard is very permissive for the judge to make those determinations in the first instance. And there's a distinction that the courts draw between what you do in the courtroom versus what you do outside the courtroom. You have a way better chance of recusal if you have a judge who is like doing something crazy outside the courtroom. Like there was a judge in the Microsoft case years ago, in the Microsoft antitrust case, who was given like secret interviews to reporters or something. That was a problem because it's like something you're doing outside of the bench. The, it's much harder to recuse judges for stuff they're doing on the bench as part of their duties. And that's just part of the reality of the, the uphill struggle here um, that Trump has. And, and just to clarify in terms of the rules, the Supreme Court is kind of operating on its own set True. of rules that the rest of the federal judiciary is not, right? Right. right. Okay, that's a fair point. Um, yes, it's like, who's watching the watchers, right? I mean, I think we should just put the Supreme Court, like, to the side, because it's got a lot of problems right now. Right, I just, I'm trying to help, right, the only thing that I try to do with this stuff is I'm trying to help our listeners see things from the other side, other point of view, because right now, I, I'll give you, I'll say something else, I'll be very provocative. I'm just saying, though, like, because, the, because there is an issue right now about many conflicts of interest happening at the Supreme Court. And I just think that those, I think, are kind of a separate topic, maybe for another day, than kind of these run-of-the-mill cases I think that's with fair. judges. I mean, I, I think, because, like, the stuff that's come out with the Supreme Court, to me, involve a number of really complicated issues about, you know, right. money and influence and the fact that they are the highest court in the land and you can't appeal from them and they are the final say and all of these things that um, I think raise the stakes and make things a little bit different uh, than something like what Trump has filed here or what he filed against the Manhattan. I just think it's, as long as we're talking about it, it's complicated, I think it's worth separating some of those nuances out i think that's a fair point and 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 one thing that i will say though you know there's a lot of stuff around the supreme court and that if you want to get really complicated i put it in different buckets some of it is very serious like okay there's you know billionaires like flying around in their private jet for free or whatever that seems like probably highly problematic um who have interests in front of the court that sort of thing there are separate issues where it's like okay you know, we, you know, you've made some statement at a, a given a speech at an event, and we think that you're going to be biased towards a particular organization, a particular point of view. Those sorts of charges have also been made against Supreme Court justices. And people have said or that- Or you give an interview with a Wall Street Journal reporter who- Fair. Um, but like, for example, I, yeah. I'll give you an example, right? Like when Scalia was hearing cases- and he was out hunting with Cheney, right? And people are like, look, you KF, you're biased on everything that the administration does. My point is just that the reason I was bringing it as an example is people themselves, the average people, are rarely riled up about a particular judge in a particular case. And I was trying to use an analogy of, here's a time where you might be concerned about a judge on a case. But yeah, I hear your point. I think that it's fair to say that they're different, but they're, they come in all flavors of seriousness. I would say with this one, I I'll be provocative here for a second and say this. I don't think Judge Shutkin's comments were ideal. I don't, I don't think that you would want necessarily, you would prefer, I would prefer if she had not made those comments because I do think you would rather have a judge who said nothing about Donald Trump and his criminal culpability one way or the other. Do I think it's appropriate for a judge to consider um, the... The, uh, the sentences that other people are receiving or not receiving for conduct, yes. In fact, there's a statute, uh, 18 U.S.C. 3553A, that requires judges to consider, among other things, um, not only the punishment that this person is receiving or the person's co-defendants in that case, 
but also people who've committed similar conduct in other cases and consider whether this sentence is appropriate. And so I think part of the point the judge was making is, okay, we're holding certain people accountable and not others, and so I'm going to factor that into my sentence. That actually is permissible. Um, but from purely actually to, to use the ASHA distinction between actual unfairness and perception, I think there may be some, you know, it gives a talking point that would not be, um, that, that I would prefer a judge overseeing this case didn't, didn't give to the other to the other side, so to speak, you know, the other defendant, the defendant in this case, and the defense, the, the people who are who are on his side. But it is what it is. So this, uh, these are her actual words. Okay. Okay. Well, she's sentencing him, and she's basically saying, you know, you didn't like the. She's talking to the defendant, Mr. Palmer, and she was like, you know, you didn't like the result of the election. You didn't like it because, you know, but I'm paraphrasing right now. Um, you didn't want the transition of power to take place because your guy lost. But then she says, and it is true, Mr. Palmer, you have made a very good point, one that has been made before, that the people who exhorted you and encouraged you and rallied you to go and take action and to fight have not been charged. And then she says, you know, that's not my business. And I think that quote is introduced by Trump's lawyers with the with the sentence. Judge Chutkin similarly suggested that, in her view, President Trump was responsible for the events of January 6, 2021, and should be prosecuted. First, I don't think she said anyone. She didn't say express an opinion right. about anyone should, being should prosecuted. It's a mischaracterization. It's a yeah. mischaracterization. But also, she doesn't mention Trump. She says the people who. Right exhorted you and encouraged you and rallied you. And I think George Conway is the one who made this point on Twitter, and I thought it was a good one, is actually in saying that she is blaming Donald Trump, Trump's own lawyers are kind of, I mean, giving away their own, they're kind of implicating him in that statement. It's it's interesting, because she doesn't actually say, and she actually uses the plural, she says the people, she doesn't say the president, um obviously there were there were organizers we know that you know the oath keepers have been charged the proud boys have been charged as being people who were you know actually conspiring to do this so i don't know i mean i get your point about the perception but i think that's a much vaguer statement than even one that should rise to any kind of perception issue all right last week i, I thought you were wrong about candy uh, Asha, uh, Reese's peanut butter cups was very, that was very significant disagreement. I know. And this one, it's a more minor disagreement. Um, what I'll just say is, um, it's fair to say that she's referring to Trump or that it, it, uh, one would ordinarily take it that way from a perception perspective. But I actually think the better argument, if I was on the government side, the prosecution side, trying to argue against recusal, or if I was Judge Chutkin, her law clerk, writing an opinion about this would be that she's actually re reflecting the view of the defendant in that case. She's not making her own statement. She didn't just like say, hey, by the way, I have looked at a bunch of other people. I've made an independent determination that Trump is somebody you should be compared to. And I am comparing your sentence, which, by the way, would still, I think, be permissible under 18 U.S.C. 3553A. But what she was basically saying is you've raised the argument that Trump and others, I think that's fair to say that it would probably be Giuliani and other type, you know, whatever, whoever, Proud Boys, or uh, at the time, maybe, I don't know, whoever were not charged. And her point is, you know, uh, I'm, t I'm, taking your, I'm taking your argument, and I'm, I'm considering your argument, which, by the way, she's required to do yeah. um, as part of a sentencing, is considered the defense arguments about the potential sentence. So Yeah. Okay. I think there's yeah, more daylight there. I gonna go nowhere. I mean, I think... I think there's actually more, I, I forget what the precise issue was with the Manhattan judge. I think he had donated to, there, there was something that to me in there's that There's a small case, donation to Hillary Clinton maybe or something, yeah, was that it? And like also it, he, didn't he preside over the, the trial that gave a felony conviction for the Trump organization? Even though I mean, think, there's nothing wrong about that. Well, that piece I think like, well, whatever, like he, yeah, right. he gets cases. Stop committing but, crimes. But yeah, I think like, you know, and, and even there, I don't think that it warranted his recusal, but I do think the political donation to 
you know, especially given that that particular crime was about him trying to, you know, allegedly circumvent campaign finances, finance laws in an election against Hillary Clinton. I know this is like many, many years ago now. Sure. But that particular case, if you'll recall, the Stormy Daniels stuff was actually him running against, um, you know, Hillary Clinton. And that would have been the opponent at issue in kind of the context of the crime that's being alleged there. So you're saying there's actually something more to that motion? I I thought both were pretty bad. They were bad. I'm just saying, I personally think if you made an argument, if you were going to make an argument that one looked bad or had a perception issue, I think the political donation one has a greater perception problem than the one that Chutkin made. I don't think there's anything wrong with what Chutkin said. Yeah, well, that's fine. I mean, I, I think it, my view, I didn't think there's anything wrong about it. I don't think she did anything wrong, but I think I, I can see the perception issue there, but I just, I, it doesn't, it's not going to go anywhere. I do think it was a mistake. I'll just kind of put, to put something out there that I want to make clear about my position on it. I did say on Twitter X, whatever the hell it is now, uh, that I thought it was a mistake. And I do, because one thing I'll just say, I said this in a prior episode, right? Judkin's very smart, very savvy. Uh, very experienced uh, litigator. And she knew, already knew how to sort of deal with Trump. Like when Trump was violating her rules, like, okay, I'm going to, you know, okay, this is how it's going to go. You're going to get an early fast trial. I will just tell you, there's so many ways a judge can totally screw you in the course of trying a case um, if they really want to. And pissing off a judge who has got a lot of discretionary calls to make and can make your life very, 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 very difficult is rarely a good idea. And I, I understand that there are a lot of there are lawyers who have a different view on this, but I, my judgment uh, is a, a very experienced litigator and, and, and criminal defense lawyers and, and former prosecutors is a very bad idea. And while we're at it, we might as well talk about Judge Cannon because this issue came up in our case as well, where people felt that the government should be asking her to recuse because of. I mean, frankly, her outright bias uh, for Trump, but even that would have been an uphill battle, right? I mean, she right. wasn't going to, obviously, and and it and I think there was some, you know, one of these like crazy debates then about oh, but then the Eleventh Circuit could force her to recuse, and that's not going to happen either. No, that's not going to happen either. That was always some sort of fanciful, like internet commentator BS. Um, and, and judge Jack Smith, Jack Smith had the same, I think, judgment I did on this, right? Yeah, like he didn't want to, he didn't bother. Yeah. You look, you're, you're going to piss her off more. Uh, that's really a bad idea. I mean, we already know where she stands. Let her do something really stupid and then make an issue of it at that point and get to a point where I, what I would do is wait for her to really screw up, go up to the, what's the 11th circuits, the court of appeals, just so everyone knows what we're talking about. Go up to the 11th circuit court of appeals at that time when she does something really stupid makes a big mistake at the, and then deal with it then and just have it be that you're not saying she's unfair and you're not attacking her personally, but you're saying, hey, this was a mis- an error. Um, he's handling that exactly the way I would. What about her making these sua sponte orders, like directing the defense to particular legal arguments? I, I you know what? I, 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 I would just deal with those. I mean, in other words, other than speed, like let's just say that there was no speed issue here. Okay, there's no timing issue. That wouldn't mean very, I mean, I wouldn't be thrilled about him if I was prosecuting that case, but it wouldn't bother me either. They're all meritless arguments. Every argument that she makes that I kind of can put in front of her and explain away on the front end is a couple of things. First of all, there's no, I just narrowing down any appellate issue. Like he's getting all the help in the world. He's raising every argument in the world and we're dealing with it. And if she did something wrong, then, then I'm going to be able to go up to the Court of Appeals or make an issue on it. I mean, the, the concern that I'd have, I would be very respectful in responding to that stuff because the issue is she, unlike Chutkin, is not a very experienced litigator. If she really was smart about this and savvy about trying to be in, the, in league with Trump on this or to, to throw it for Trump, what she would do, I think we've talked about this many weeks ago, right? She yeah. she wouldn't do this stuff. She'd be like she would lay low. She'd lay right. low. And that's Chutkin. Chutkin's like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna 
tell you you can't speak on Truth Social, you 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 exercise that First Amendment right. We'll see how that does with the trial calendar. Like that that's that's savvy, okay? That's savvy, but that's not where a Judge Cannon is. There, remember, she's the anti. She's the, she the anti cannon. Anti -cannon. Okay, so among the many things that um, were happening last week, one was that the Fulton County Special Grand Jury unredacted report was released on Friday. If you'll recall, Special Grand Jury <laughs> met... Uh, last year, and I think concluded its work in around December of 2022, the special grand jury is investigative, but it did not have the power to um, hand down any indictments. But basically, Bonnie Willis used it to kind of do this very extensive investigation. They issued a report, I think around February, parts of the report were released, the beginning and the end, I think. And um and we knew then that the special grand jury had recommended indicting some number of people and even said that they believed that some of the witnesses had perjured themselves. So this is why we were all at the edge of our seats waiting for who she was going to indict. And um, it was taking a lot of time and people were like, what's happening there? But I think we've also talked about why the speedy trial rule in Georgia uh would want would make her want to wait and have all of her I's dotted and T's crossed and basically ready to go to trial before she went down that road because if, as has now happened with Kenneth Cheesebro and Sidney Powell, she's forced to go to trial, she needs to be able to do that. Anyway, so that special grand jury report was released and basically um, it wasn't very long and it basically broke down different types of conduct, the statutes that they fell under, and how the grand jury voted on each defendant as it related to that conduct and whether they believed that that particular individual should be charged. And I think it was notable that for many of them, including the, mo the defendants, most of the defendants that ended up being charged, um, it was near unanimous. Um, that for those defendants, it was, you know, mostly I think there was like one holdout, but most of the jur grand special grand jurors were believed that that person should be indicted. And then for others, they were much more divided, um, you know, and there was much less agreement and con uh, consensus about um, those people. But there was a lot of talk because clearly the people that were listed um, and where a majority of the special grand jurors recommended indictment, many of them were not charged. And I think there were a lot of questions about why. So I thought it would be worth just unpacking that. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, one thing I'll say as sort of a overarching comment is, I guess what I learned from that was that Fonnie Willis actually exercised his discretion. Uh, yeah. I, I kind of thought of, I, I called her, I said that she were acting with like a sledgehammer at one point instead of a scalpel, which is the Jack Smith approach. I mean, she was almost like a bulldozer. She's just like, I'm going after, the way I looked at it until I saw this, I'm like, she goes after everybody. She's just like, you know what? If I could charge you, I'm going to charge you. If I could charge something, I'm going to charge it. And you figure it out. Like, you know, you could luck with that. Like, I'm throwing everything at you. That's kind of what I thought the Fonnie Willis strategy was. And it turns out, uh, no. Uh, she, in fact, had lots of options and lots of people to charge, and she really spent all these weeks, months, whatever, carefully considering who to charge and who not to charge, which is fascinating because she still ended up at a result that I thought was, like, very much a kitchen sink approach, but it turns out you could have, like, an entire appliance, you know, kitchen appliance set um, in addition to the kitchen sink. <laughs> Uh, and so she threw out the refrigerator and the dishwasher and so forth, uh, along with the, uh, you know, we kept the kitchen sink. Yeah. I used the kitchen sink metaphor when I was doing an ABC hit and I wasn't really sure whether I used it right. Okay. 
Because I think I, th- I think I said she threw the kitchen sink at a lot of people, but yeah. I think you know she threw the book at a lot of people. But I think you, I forget the kitchen sink. Anyway, I'm just thinking. About we, that digress. Um, <laughs> we digress. We digress. <laughs> um, anyway, so let's break down some of these people. Um, okay. So the big story on Friday was that um, Lindsey Graham was one of the people that the special grand jurors you know, vo- voted on, and I think it was quite divided, but they did recommend charges uh-huh. against him, as well as um, two former uh, Georgia senators. Um, and it was, you know, the, there was a lot of outrage on Twitter, and the news media was like, why didn't she charge them? And what? And to me, this was very obvious. Like, I, I think there are... There are federalism issues. There are constitutional issues. Um, there would have been more removal motions. Mm-hmm. There would have been um, an easy way for like someone like Jim Jordan to demand that you know Fonnie Willison come answer why she right. tried to impede the functions of their uh, institution. And and I think he would have frankly had a much stronger ground uh, mm-hmm. than he is doing now. So, like, I did not see, I I think she was like, look, I got 99 problems and, like, those are not any of them. And I'm just going to leave those to the side right now because I have, like, the fish that I want to fry are the people who I think I can charge and I can get past all of these, their legal issues that I think I know they're going to raise and I can prosecute them in state court. Well, it's interesting. Uh, first of all, I agree with yeah, I agree with what you what you just said. I don't disagree with it. I mean, the analogy, first of all, is to, that I would draw would be to Jack Smith deciding he didn't want to deal with insur- you know um, First Amendment issues, right? He's like, I'm not going to yeah. you know bring incitement charges because I just don't want to be spending a lot of time briefing First Amendment issues that could go right up to the Supreme Court, potentially delay my entire trial because we were dealing with these very weighty First Amendment issues. There it may have been speed. It may have been that he just thought he didn't want to deal with that legal challenge here. What I find interesting is you're right. She, I think, correctly uh, decided that she didn't want to deal with all this, like speech and debate clusters. There's all sorts of issues that she'd have to deal with regarding the, you know, like a lawmaker like um, Senator Graham, federal lawmaker. Um, but it's interesting, though, because she did take on others, right? Like the lawyers. I mean, that that's another complicated one. I, I, I've prosecuted lawyers, convicted lawyers, it's hard. Um, and so she took on some and not others. And I, like I said, it showed, it, it really changed my view of Fonnie Willis. I really, like I said, I viewed her as like sort of the hammer. She was like the Lawrence Taylor of uh, prosecutors, okay? She's just like kind of a Ronnie Lott or something. Like she's going to come and oh, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Okay. Yeah. These are famous football players who are hard hitters, who come at you. And it's like Ronnie Lott's coming to hit you. You're basically there's going to be a helmet imprint on your. Uh, you're going to have chest. a concussion. Yeah, but you're 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 in trouble. Like Lawrence Taylor's okay. coming. He's like Hall of Fame defensive players are very okay. Translating here, but my point okay. is th- that's how I viewed Fonnie Willis. It's like she's got you in her sights. You know, you're somewhere in the field. Like that's a problem. If the you know she's she's going to come after you. Um, and, and actually, like I said, it, it, it really actually changed my view of her team and the prosecution, which was maybe more measured than I gave her credit to be more discretion. And, and, you know, I will just say now some of these, I think were easy calls. That one was, but you know, and one thing you mentioned, Asha, and I think it's in, w- worth noting is you said the grand jurors were not, you know, unanimous on a lot of these. I, I used to use, and I was a, f- a federal prosecutor for many years. I used to use the grand jurors almost like a, a testing ground. <laughs> um, there, there were always, I never had a situation where I got a no bill. In other words, they voted against me or where it was like very close. But even if they have a bunch of questions about an issue, like that to me is like a warning sign. They're like a, t- a test subjects. <laughs> like, okay, if they're concerned about something, I need to, I'll put in a bunch of evidence on that to them, but I need to deal with this before trial. And I'd say, you know, the, the way that grand juries work, prosecutors are in there alone. There's no defense. There's no other side. There's no cross-examination. And if you aren't getting everybody there, then that's a really good sign that you have some issues with your case. Yeah. By the way, the sports metaphor I would have understood is if you said, I thought she was Tanya Harding, everybody. 
Well, Tanya Harding guess. was unfair. Tanya Harding was like kneecapping you afterwards. I know. Uh, okay. okay. okay These okay, are like I'm just totally saying. fair Hall of Fame players. It's like a it flattery, but like it's it's there's not a lot of discretion in like these players. You get what I'm saying? Like there's just they're okay. coming at you. Like oh, okay, you're... they're doing their job, but they're not really being discerning on Correct. their targets. Correct. Okay. They're coming at you. Right. Okay, fair enough. Fair distinction. Fair distinction. I'm just saying, if you want to use this figure skating analogy in, in the future, I will be much more on board with it. Um, but I think that you know what you said. It was something I was thinking about. Like, I wonder she kind of had because most prosecutors don't have this advantage of a special grand jury that kind of mm-hmm. signals all of this right like she had a i mean especially after presenting all this evidence all mm-hmm. these witnesses she could see that oh my gosh only whatever 10 9 10 special grand jurors recommended indicting lindsey graham or whoever it was which right. i mean there were many other reasons to not indict him but like she could get uh it was like a folks group yeah of yeah you know if you can't even get of sorts, like, yeah. yeah and and that the bar was much lower for them. So I think that she could um, be more discerning. I will say there were people, though, Renato, who, again, had near unanimity in terms of their culpability. People like Cleta Mitchell, who I've never heard mentioned anywhere. And she's, honestly, she's the person who was the original architect of this whole plan that then Eastman took up John Eastman took up the baton so um I'm just really curious how she, and she's by, by the way out there still um promoting the big lie yeah and she is the one lawyer it seems that hasn't really been um touched in any of this whether it's disbarment proceedings whether it's you know prosecutions or anything well, there's a line that that's part of the challenge with the prosecuting lawyer. There's definitely a line between like, you know, presenting your First Amendment views or counseling someone versus actually committing a crime. And so certainly helping people commit crimes is something that lawyers are not permitted to do. But obviously, you know, there's a distinction there and there's a lot of defenses that lawyers have that people don't. One thing I will say, you know, you talked about how you know, she had this wide swath of people that she was considering. She narrowed it down. That is hard for all prosecutors. And it's something that you do in a wide variety of cases. I mean, there were times, you know, when I wouldn't, you know, there was, I remember investigating a a very violent street gang um, in in Chicago. We had to figure out, it's like, okay, we have 40 something people we could charge. (laughs) And it's like, who do we want to charge? Who do we want to send to the state for them to charge or have them? We were working kind of in you know cooperation with them uh who do we just want to let go and there's all sorts of considerations there about how strong the case is you know what ends up happening asha is it's often maybe in this case donald trump going is going to trial but it's usually not like defendant one two or three are the problem it's like defendant 17 who you threw in there late at late at night uh in your indictment and that suddenly like the girlfriend of the drug dealer who was involved in you know uh whatever a bunch of you know, a bunch of uh, deliveries is the one who wants to go to trial. And you're like, oh boy, why did I throw her in that indictment? Like you have to really carefully consider each person, make sure you have the evidence, make sure you know you're going to prevail at trial, make sure you're, you're doing the right thing. Sometimes you charging everyone, even if, even in, in, in an ordinary case, even if you have the evidence, is this the right thing to do to charge them? You have to consider all of that for each person very carefully. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like even 19 defendants is quite large and unwieldy as it is. Yes. I mean, I've seen, I've been there for trials of those sorts where there's like 20 something defendants where there was like a courtroom where you had a bunch of different tables set up and it's, it's a mess to do those kind of trials. And you'd have to, I think, seriously consider, do you want to have multiple indictments? And so, yeah, I think that there's a number of different considerations. There's also resource issues. You have prosecutors to handle all of these cases, all these defendants. You know, there's speed issues. Like I said, she didn't, that was my, I mean, we joked about it at the time. She died. It. It's just like she didn't care. Like, I'm going to just, I, I, I'm going to just, I'm in this for as long as it takes because every time you indi- indict some, another person, that's another defense team and another set of schedules and another set of motions. So, 
There's a lot of consideration that goes towards it. Indicting somebody is a massive commitment of resources on behalf of a prosecutorial office um, or often. And so they, you should be doing that with great care. Uh, obviously, you're also changing someone's life. So you should take care for that reason, too. Yeah. And I think we need to rem- remember also that the fact that Bonnie Willis has had the courage to move forward on this doesn't mean that it's really her job to vindicate the harm that was caused to the whole country. Like, honestly, you know, like a lot of that job belongs to Jack Smith um, in terms of the national harm. Um, a lot of that job belongs to other states. And we've seen Michigan move forward with the fake electors in that state. I mean, this there were a lot of different players involved. And I think, you know, and some of them touched on the Georgia thing. But at the end of the day, you know, she has to think about the injury to the state of Georgia and the people of the state of Georgia and who she's going to secure convictions against for the harm that they cause. Uh, But I think it's unfair to put on her, you know, whatever, like 50 (laughs) defendants when, you know, when some of those people could very well and and perhaps should be implicated uh, in other jurisdictions. I, I, yeah, I go beyond that. I mean, I personally think prosecutors and I, and I say this as somebody who spent a lot, many years of my life doing this and thousands and thousands of hours, you know, in prosecuting defendants. I don't think prosecutors are heroes. And their job is not to right all of society's wrongs. Their job is to, um, you know, look at the evidence before them and make charge, you know, make charging decisions and prosecute if there's sufficient evidence. And if it, like I said, if it's the right thing to do, okay, sometimes it's just not even the right thing to do in certain circumstances. That's when prosecutors are supposed to charge. And it's not, like you said, she's not the sort of, she's not like the, you know, the Archangel Michael or something. Her job is not to like to hit the hand of God flying around uh, the United States writing wrongs. And, and I will say, those of you listening to this or in other media who are like lionizing, whether it's Jack Smith or her or others, they're prosecutors who are doing their job and that's good. But th- that's, I don't think we should put prosecutors on a pedestal, even though I was one for many years. And I think, and maybe I'll be someday again. I don't know. But I think uh, I just, I think they're doing their job and we have to put them in their proper place and understand that they're not there to solve all of society's problems. And that's why we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't take responsibility away from ourselves, from ourselves yeah. and from our elected representatives for doing that as well. And I think the other piece that gets to what you're saying, Renato, is, you know, she and other prosecutors are the last resort. Like mm-hmm. that's like when everything has failed, you know, and yeah. Uh, you know, we have failed as like voters as a country. Like now we're relying on these people. And I remember thinking this also with um, special counsel Mueller. Um, but really, the answer is, you know, maybe we shouldn't be putting people in office who are going to try to overturn elections. And and strengthen the and strengthen the guardrails that will make it harder for that to happen. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. 100%. I was going to say the latter is what I was thinking. It's like maybe she should have structural changes to make sure that we don't aren't in the situation again. And, and I think for any other societal problem, we would think of it that way. Like we're not like, oh, people are, you know, children are being, you know, sexually abused and assaulted. Oh, well, we've got prosecutors who'll deal with it. They'll see, they'll, they'll handle all those people. And it's like, well, that, we don't want that to happen in the first place. So we need to, do things in our community to make sure this never happens. And so like, we don't want to be like, Oh, don't worry. We got prosecutors to like clean it up when we have, you know, insurrections and unrest and the peaceful transfer of power doesn't happen in our country. And they're there to solve all these problems. Like that's not their job. They're not there to solve our problems. They're there to look at evidence and make charging decisions. And it's not, it's not heroic and they're not saving the world. They're doing their jobs and that's great, but that's, that's not, we shouldn't be kind of putting them, uh, as sort of the 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 one you know, so they're the saviors as of the, the United States. Of democracy, yeah, yeah, that's not their job. So, Renato, before we go, um, you know, we've been talking, you and I, offline, because you've been dealing with a lot of stuff, um, on the home front. 
And you and I are the same age. And I think, you know, you're not the first person that I've talked to that's going through a phase where our parents are aging. And, you know, a lot of the responsibility to make sure that they're okay is falling on us. And I just thought maybe that's something we could talk about. Yeah. It's a, it's a very difficult subject. It's been such a big change in my life. Uh, I was an only child. Um, and not because my parents didn't want to have more kids, but they weren't able to, uh, you know, tried very hard to have more kids. Um, but, you know, I, my parents took care of me very well, and I was very fortunate to have parents who both worked two jobs and put me through school and all that. And now I'm in the spot where I have to take care of my parents. Um, particularly, I moved back very close to where I grew up. Um, and so I'm close to my mom. I get to see her all the time, but, um, you know, she is, she's, you know, changed a lot over the last several years. And, uh, you know, this just recently had a fall that was very, um, that was very bad where she fell and was not able to get up. Um, and, you know, I'm in touch with her very regularly, but I hadn't been for a day or so. And, um, you know, uh, she wasn't responding to emails and texts and it was very, um, difficult. So, um, she's fine now. She was hospitalized. You know, I had a rush over there with, with the police, uh, you know, trying to see what, you know, what, what, what had happened. I didn't, frankly, I thought she had passed. Um, but, uh, it's just, it's very hard. I mean, my mom is going, you know, it's just, it's, she's doing very well now as things go, but just, there's a, it's just seeing your parents change is hard. Seeing yeah. your parents struggle with things is hard. Um, thinking about, you know, um, you know, in the future, what you're going to have to do to take care of your parents. It's just a very challenging thing. And there are no easy answers to those things. It's just, it's part of life. But I think you, I don't know about you, but I've always thought of, I you think of yourself as a young person and you're very focused on the future and this and that. You have all these endless you know, endless things. And then this is like, no, this, this is sort of almost, it's, it, it's a, it's a sign that life's got seasons and this is not a happy season in a certain way. Yeah. And it must be much harder as a only child. Like I know for me, you know, I have an older sister and, um, you know, my, I, I feel like in many ways, you know, she is, lives in texas and she has enough room for you know my mom to be there for extended periods of time and you know my dad is still quite sprightly and gallivanting around the world but you know um just having a sibling you know that i i feel like is someone who would be able to be there to deal with this with me i think it can make a huge difference like i think as an only child it must be a huge feeling of responsibility um to carry yeah it's it, it's a lot it makes me um you know i i feel guilty a lot of times if i have other things going on uh, i work a lot and so i'm just like you know if i can't be there uh for for her or if i you know you you're always i'm always thinking like if i don't see her if i don't talk to her if, <laughs> it's like oh my god i have to travel this weekend for, for you know for a funeral like does this mean you know, missing at the time to see my mom, like, you know, is that, you know, how is that going to, you know, I don't know, but you, you don't feel like there's someone else there, right. All the time. So. Yeah. You're from, I mean, you have, you're from an immigrant family, um, or at least a couple of generations ago and maybe not your parents, I, I don't think, but, um, did you grow up with your grandparents living with you? I did. Yeah. My grandmother lived with us. So my grandfather on my mother's side died young. Um, and so my grandmother lived with us. She didn't really have anything. And so we supported her. And so she was like a third parent to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was hard when she passed. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is definitely a thing as well, right? Do you, you know, do you have your parents live with you too? Um, but it's challenging. Um, my, I mean, your, my, my mom likes her independence and loves, you know, she's got friends and does, does things and, you know, it's a challenge. I have life for her now, not to, I'm not advertising for them, but I, you know, 
you do, you know, these things, you see this stuff growing up and you're like, oh, these commercials or whatever. And like, you know, but it's, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, I hope that she, you know, continues to recover um, and is that you're you're able to check on her and um, be there for her. Thanks, Asha. M S W Media.